Hello everyone, just giving you a brief warning that this interview will contain a few spoilers from the Enderall video game. Hello everybody, this is Angel Arts, and welcome once again to another special Let's Interview Some Awesome People That I've Met. This is actually part two of uh, a continuation of a previous uh, interview that I had with Nicholas Litzau. Welcome back, Nicholas. Thank you for um, having me. Thank you, thank you for coming back and not being scared the last time. <laughs> um, uh, and for some reason, Nicholas decided, hey, why don't I bring a friend with me next time when, when, uh, when uh, we're chatting with Hark. So I'm also here with another guest, uh, Ben Britton. Or Britton? <laughs> Britton. Yeah, typically Britain Britton sounds great. Yeah. Typically Britton. Um, and... For those of you who um, are not aware, uh, these folks are here because we've been talking about, well, first we were talking about Enderal, which is a video game that was built off of the Skyrim engine um, several years back, six years ago. And Nicolas happens to be the writer slash one of the co-producers of that project. And Ben is one of the voice actors for one of the main NPCs uh, that you get to meet in the world of Enderall. And I think everyone who's in my channel knows how much I absolutely adore Jaspar. So this is a really, I'm screaming internally in my head right now. So I'm trying to maintain my composure <laughs> so that I might actually have friends at the end of the day after this. But, um, but uh, yeah, uh, we're kind of just hanging out and, you know, not only talking about uh, the game as, as well as uh, a novel that Nicolas actually wrote and published very recently. Uh, again, we talk about this more at great length in my previous interview, so please do check that out. I will have links in the bottom. Um, and, you know, because... Uh, the other cool thing about the new novel is that it happens to be uh, read, the audio version of it, or will be read uh, by Ben himself, uh, because the book actually uh, tells the backstory of Jaspar uh, before the events of Enderal. Yes, Ben, like I said, I'm going to start with you because uh, I hadn't had a chance to get to know you before this. I found out very recently that you were born in Maryland. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. And I grew up in Maryland, actually. What? Oh my God, no <laughs> yeah. kidding. Okay. I, I, I now live in Northern Virginia. I only crossed the river to okay. marry my husband. Oh, awesome. Um, so I pretty much had lived in Maryland the entire time uh, up until, uh, I want to say six years ago, six or seven years ago. Okay, awesome. Very um, good. So... I'll, I'm very curious about your experience there, but I'll probably save that for later. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. Um, but, but you know, you, you were born in Maryland. Uh, you went to school at New York University's Tisch School of the Arts. Yep. I'm presuming studying theater? Yep. I'm presuming? Okay. Yep. Um, I don't know. Maybe you studied engineering and sure. then decided, hey, right. I'm going to do voice acting. You know, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, and then from, then, from there, uh, you eventually moved on to do a lot of, voice work um, for many video games, including Rohan Tahir in Spellforce 3, yeah. uh, Miles in Lamplight City, mm -hmm. a number of different voices in Battle Chef Brigade, yeah. and most recently, uh, you were Steve Crow in The Occupation. Yes. Yeah. So I promise I'm not stalking you. I just like to do my homework before this. <laughs> I promise. It's great. It's great. I have to, I have to know what, what I'm yeah, talking about. No, it's fantastic. So um, I guess the big obvious question is, how, how did you first get into voice acting? What made you decide, you know, this is something that you wanted to do? That, that's actually a, a, it's a long story that I'll try and keep fairly brief. Um, so I had, I had been doing theater when I came out of college. And um, because that was what I had gone to school for. Um, I had always been a huge fan of animation and video games and um, had been into that since I was a kid. One of the one of the first things I did when I graduated from college was build my own computer because they were really just kicking off. My roommate had a PC when I was in in college in the 90s. 
and he played Diablo one yes. all the time. And I mm-hmm. was, I was like <laughs> any spare moment I could jump on there and play that. Uh, yeah. I did, but the idea of getting into VO at the time was kind of, it almost felt, it felt like an impossibility because VO felt like a wall, this massive walled fortress back then. Okay. It was like, there was okay. this handful of people and they were the people and they were in everything. And okay. the, you had to, you had to dedicate all of your focus to getting into that industry if you wanted to do it. Mm. Um, and then years passed and, and life stuff happens okay. and, uh, we get into the two thousands past college and I'm doing local theater, um, which I loved. And there were some, there was an assortment of things that made local theater start to become really difficult to do. Uh, one of which was, was having kids and there was some other stuff that was involved as well that made it tough. Um, and I had to take a break and near that same time, uh, Jane Jensen, who is um, a famous video game developer from back in the 90s, uh, who makes point and click video games, uh, who created the Gabriel Knight series. Okay. Uh, she founded her own game studio via Kickstarter in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And for years, I had thought, okay, there is no way that I can do any of that stuff. I live outside of Philly like at the edge of farm country, there is, I I have no way of getting into that industry. I need to be either in New York or in, in LA all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when Jane did that, I, I actually just reached out to her, uh, like a crazy person and was just saying, Hey, what you are one of the inspirations for, for my gaming, like history. And uh, if there's anything you would ever need just from a, just somebody to help out with doing anything around the studio or anything like that, I would love to get involved. Mm -hmm. And her husband, Robert, uh, actually got back in touch with me because he was their audio engineer. And he he and I ended up having lunch one day because he he actually was right nearby where I was. And we just talked about all of this stuff and getting into this industry and doing just VO in general. Mm -hmm. And it sort of set me on the path to doing this. So I I definitely owe them a debt of gratitude, which is, is kind of, kind of very cool. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a moment that I kind of, I I cherish when it comes to to how things have ended up. Uh, Shortly after that, this was, Oh God, this was back in like, 2011 or 12, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, shortly after that, the Skyrim workshop kicked off on Steam. And I started to see a bunch of people making these additions to Skyrim uh, yeah. mod, mods at the time. And uh, I mean, mods now, it's still the same thing. It's, but the idea that they needed voiced content for this stuff was intriguing and it was like okay this is an opportunity i know nothing about the technical aspects of voiceover i don't know anything about about the equipment i'm going to need or any of the any of the sundry details to do it but i know how to act i mean that's what i that's what i went to school for so this is those are skills that i already had i just needed to learn the technical side of things and i've always been pretty good with the tech side of stuff so it was like sure i can pick this up and with that, I started sort of jumping in with both feet heavily into the, initially it was the Skyrim and the Fallout New Vegas uh, mod communities. I did a ton of stuff in there. Mm-hmm. And one of the projects that I came across that looked super intriguing and incredibly ambitious to me was Enderall. Yes. And, <laughs> and I think I reached out asking about that saying essentially here's here's who i am here's my history yeah if there's anything you guys need let me know i would love to be involved so you actually reach out to them instead of the other way around yeah oh yeah. that's so cool yeah. yeah this was and then then like 
I think I did the same thing with some of the other video game studios that I yeah. I've now worked with for years. Um, the folks who made who made the occupation, the Steve Crow game. Uh, I I was talking to them because they they the first that might have been the first commercial title that I was in was a game called Ether One uh, that they made that was one of the original Steam Greenlight games. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. Like back in the beginning of the Greenlight program, uh, Greenlight was everything had to get had to get Valve's blessing to get in onto mm. Steam. This mm -hmm. is back before they opened the floodgates and everything can be on Steam now. Right, I remember that. Yes. So yes. there, there used to be this vetting pro process where they would they would scrutinize each project, yeah. and Ether One was one of the ones that had successfully made it through, and I ended up uh, voicing some characters for that, and they are over in the UK. Um, and I think, I think I did the exact same thing with them. I think like a crazy person, I just reached out and was like, Hey guys, here's who I am. If you guys ever need anything, just let me know. Cause the project looks amazing. And, uh, yeah. and that's how all of this kicked off. What amazes me about your story is correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like the, the modding community are the ones that sort of kicked off this this voiceover that's, that's career definitely for you. that's definitely where i got my feet wet yeah absolutely that's so neat because it it because traditionally the modding community are not are, are non-profit normally it's just a bunch of fans who have some technical writing you know well it backgrounds presents, that it right does, it does present itself as an opportunity for for people who are looking to get into the industry sure um, yeah. and sort of there are certain techniques that you can only pick up through experience. It's the same thing exactly. with theater. It's like if if you yeah. wanna, the the practice really does make perfect. The more you get used right. to this kind of thing, the more time you spend in front of the mic, the more time you spend on stage. Uh, it's kind of the same thing. The 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 muscles you're building are different, uh, and uh, from stage versus theater, mm -hmm. the type of performance can be different, but the idea of gaining the experience and using that to sort of build on uh that that's exactly the same so yeah yeah yeah, yeah i was just gonna say the same obviously i'm not a voice actor but um a lot of the uh via, um voice actors we worked with were actually you know looking to get their feet but all to build up a mm -hmm. portfolio so and i think it's a great opportunity you know besides the technical aspect and you know finding your way around the craft um i think it's also incredibly helpful to build a reputation in the fan base, I would say. I mean, obviously, yeah. um, many voice, like many modding projects fail or never see the light of day, which is why some more experienced voice actors are, you know, have gotten a bit more hesitant about helping modding projects because it's a bit of a gamble. Mm -hmm. But um, if a studio, you know, has a reputation, or like a team, a modding team has a reputation for getting their projects done, then it's actually right. a great opportunity. And several voice actors reached out to us um, you know, not all of them ended up obviously with um, main roles because there just weren't that many main roles. But um, a lot of the voice talent we 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 were fortunate enough to work with for for Andral were well, I, I hate the word, but you know, starting starting out, I don't want to say amateur because obviously most of them also were professionals, but they sure. were just starting out, and that's so yeah. Yeah, and it's in it's interesting because it's you can be. You can be an amateur voice actor, but still be a seasoned actor. Mm -hmm. So that's true. That yes. that makes a big yes. difference. The 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 acting experience yep. is obviously exceptionally helpful when it comes to to doing this kind of thing, uh, yeah. knowing how to sort of break down a role and how to mm -hmm. identify where you can add texture and yeah. what what the writers are going right. for and things like that. Some yeah. of those are skills sure. that take a long time to develop. Some people have that stuff yeah. naturally, some people don't. Yeah. And you can work on that kind of thing. Um, but there is a difference. I, I think I had the benefit of jumping into the VO side of things and just essentially treating it like a, uh, a yeah. different medium to do the exact same stuff I had already been yeah. doing for yeah. years and years and years. Right. And, years. Um, and I think there are a lot of people in the VO industry that probably have the same kind of background. They came from... Yes, a theater sure. background and mm -hmm. spent their whole lives acting and they just sort of transitioned into a slightly different way of doing it that does require some different uh, skills and muscles as it were but it's still 
fundamentally, it's still the exact same thing. You just, yeah. um, you just have to train yourself to do it a little bit differently. And then there's also different like sub, uh, genres inside VO in and of itself that, I mean, it's the same thing applies to, to, to stage acting, the different skill sets for different types of roles, but, um, that goes with VO as well. And all that stuff you just pick up by doing it and you need that opportunity to do it. And the modding community for me presented that kind of opportunity. Um, I think it was a win-win. <laughs> I think it was, yes. it was great. It was, it <laughs> right. was perfect. It was, it was exactly what I needed at the time. And, uh, yeah, I and like you were saying, Nicholas, there was a bunch of stuff that I recorded for that probably never saw the light of day. So oh. back in the day, there was probably oh, I don't even know how many projects there were, but I know I was uh -huh. I threw myself into it like sure. whole cloth, doing everything I could, uh, taking in every project I could find and recording mountains of material, and I I'm sure some of it never never got released because I mean, that goes, that goes with the territory. That is kind of right. Yes. Part of the business. But you kind of have to be used. Mm -hmm. You kind of have to be prepared for that mentally. Yeah. Sure. Um, oh yeah. You have to be prepared for that. Cause that's, think, that's even with game development, that kind of thing can happen. It's, it's not even that's... game development is a marathon of a process. And mm -hmm. the more time you spend working with developers and seeing these things sort of grow and evolve throughout their development cycle, and change sometimes radically change. Mm -hmm. um, you you kind of you you see behind the curtain as far as yes. how a lot of these games come into existence, and it gives you a whole new perspective on yeah, well, yeah. on the amount the massive massive amount of work that goes yeah. into into game development. I mean, I would say that the difference is that if you do VO for a studio, you're you're getting paid. So even if the project <laughs> never sees the light of day, you at least mm. there is that. There is that. There yes. is that. And there's of course, you know, the 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 fact that a project is being developed professionally ensures like a, it gives a bit of certainty. Like it's mm. I think it's it's so much more likely to, for modding projects to fail. I think I might be wrong about this, but to my knowledge, um, Enderal is the only Total Conversion that ever got released, I think. Hmm. I might be I wrong. Believe but I believe so. Sure. For Skyrim, I think it is. For Skyrim, for Skyrim. For Skyrim. Yeah, yeah, I was talking about Skyrim. So, yeah. I know I saw something talking about it being the largest Skyrim mod ever made, like, yeah, and this was a few yeah. years ago when they were yeah. talking yeah. about it. Yeah, there's always this, like, the, the Sky Oblivion and the Skywind team. Um, right. You know, I'd heard about that one. I, I I don't know too many details about I mean, it. It's but, been uh, in development for a long time. You know? Well, and that's the that's the that's the thing that blows my mind about Enderall. <laughs> overall, is yeah. the fact that <laughs> on paper it looks like an impossible task. Yeah, on paper, it's one of those things that's like this is never this is this is crazy. There's no way this actually happens. There's no way they build right. a whole game on top of Skyrim, on top of the Skyrim engine. And basically use it as a platform instead of mm -hmm. instead of just adding content to Skyrim, um, right? And and consequently, the fact that it it is successful, that it is this thing yes. that that just literally exists and can be downloaded off of Steam, no less. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly is is something I am intensely proud to be a part of. It's um, right. Thank you. It's an honor to be a part of it. Yeah, because yeah. It, it feels like this. Herculean task that was achieved. It's really, really kind of blows my mind every time I think about it. I'm kind of, it sounds probably sounds pretty weird, but it, it sometimes feels good and kind of validating to hear that people are aware how much work it was because I think some people <laughs> yeah. were actually in the indie game in this um, community and in Germany. I mean, that was the exception, but um, there was some very weird people who were kind of constantly uh, you, who were looking down on us because they said, oh, it's just a mod. And well, it's mm. technically a mod, but you know, we've been but, working our asses off for like four right, years, yeah. doing 60 right. hour, hour weeks. And, but they were just, yeah, that was just happened a couple of times. But. The production value itself, like again, not only voice actors, but the soundtrack and yeah. oh yeah, the, for me, and I feel like many people are in the same spot as me. I actually, to be perfectly honest, much, much, much prefer Enderal versus the base Skyrim game. <laughs> like, I, 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 I enjoyed Skyrim, but I definitely enjoyed Enderal 
in for me way more and um I, I yeah I like I find myself remembering so many moments from Endral and if you were to ask me what do you remember from Skyrim I can't really test say I really can't tell you other than I took an arrow to the knee like that's the only thing <laughs> yeah. I can think of yeah, so, yeah. I remember that but yeah but um but I wanted to ask um since uh Ben sort of sort of brought up so he came he came to you um Nicholas or your you know he came to your your group how many other candidates were there for the role of Jaspar and what made you decide, you know, Ben's the one, Ben is, ben is our Jaspar? Well, there were definitely a couple, um, but to be honest, oh, I mean, it's so, it was so long ago, but yeah, I think wow. that you, you did like a very, like, uh, I think you sent us some, some samples and then mm -hmm. the audition and I think I immediately knew like that you were the favorite because just because I, I think I still remember, you know, what I always look for is just like the authenticity and right off the bat, Jaspar just felt like a real person. Uh, yeah. Past yeah. And, you know, with a complex background and, and even, and that was, even though, you know, it was just like, I just gave you a couple of lines to work with. <laughs> yeah. Nicholas, did you already have in your head when you were writing Jaspar, did you personally have something in your head as to what he might sound like or what his vibe yes. was like? Oh, you well, did. I probably okay. Say, I should probably say that we recorded the German Jaspar, okay. voiced by Martin Zabel, who's very like he's a very renowned German voice actor, and um, we worked with him on. I mean, I wasn't part of Sure I back then, but Sure I worked with him back on the previous project, and so um, way before we started even translating, um, we had uh, we had like German recordings to use as a reference. I might have even sent you them. I'm not sure. I think you did. I think I, I, did. I yeah, I think like, I had just just for tone. It was like just for tone, yeah. It was it was like, okay, yeah, it's all in German. But the but still, still I get the I get the vibe because it was like you'd send me a block yeah. of text and you'd send me mm. that and I it's mean, like, okay, sure. German yeah, I get where we're going. It definitely sounds different. Like um mm. I, I would say yes has, has the same vibe, but um I think we talked about this hark in a, a previous conversation, like Martin Zabel just he has like this very villainous voice. <laughs> oh. Yeah, but no, he, he really okay. does. He really does. Yeah. Um, but it's it's cool. And, you know, that's actually a, an interesting anecdote. It's like the previous writer for Shuri I, who um, Benjamin Arlett, he was, um, I, I was, we were talking about the voice acting because I had no, no experience going into this. And he suggested like a very, well, lighthearted kind of, um, mm -hmm. Jester kind of guy, uh, voice because Jesper was, you know, he has like this sarcasm and this sense of humor. Yeah. And I was actually opposed to that from the very start. I said, no, I think I think Jesper's voice needs some some something to kind of edgier, darker, darker to to juxtapose like his lightness because this is, mm -hmm. you know, I, I wouldn't say it's a facade because obviously Jesper has like. He enjoys life and all that, but you know, there's a lot more going on beneath the surface. He's multi-layered. Mm. He's multi-layered, and I think, I think, you know, um, but I think you just, you just managed to put that into the audition right away. So, okay. Um, I mean, well, I would that's, say you're, yeah. That's great. That's, uh, no, sure. I, I, it's, it's crazy that I can barely remember this because it was like, <laughs> it was like half a decade ago or more. Um, but I do, I do, re I. I do vaguely recall recording some some sides for you guys with with mm. that kind of stuff where you sent over some some dialogue samples and we're like, can you can you give us some of these? And mm -hmm. uh, I, clearly, I guess it, it was it was what you guys were looking for. But th there does seem to be this even even with his dialogue back then, mm. uh, there is kind of this inherent cynicism to him. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That that. Right has a cause. There's a reason for him being cynical about things because you hear about his background and his background coming from a wealthy family, things like that. Mm -hmm. he, he had to be, I don't want to say driven to cynicism, but there were, there are things in his history that make him, right. make him highly cynical. Oh, exactly. Sure. And for sure. yeah. you, the fun is discovering those things, especially yeah. from an audience standpoint. And right. on top of that, since it's a video game, you're engaged in the process as a player of yes. discovering those things yeah. about this yeah. person. Absolutely. Um, 
And that kind of thing is fascinating to me. That that yeah. presents this this. There's something about that as a just being an option in video games that is not really mm-hmm. available in any other medium where mm-hmm. the sure. player themselves can be involved in unraveling more details about characters that they are engaged with, which mm-hmm. fascinates me and I find to be just one of the coolest things about doing video game work. Um, it's also one of, it can be one of the most challenging things too, because you have to, whenever you're doing something, you have to kind of put yourself in the author's shoes, trying to identify where they're going with certain characters, what they're sort of aiming to achieve. And then you also have to put yourself in the, the audience's shoes, in the player character's shoes. And sometimes you have, you may do this kind of stuff and not even know what the player character might be responding with, with certain Mm -hmm. lines of dialogue, as far as lead ins go. Oh, and yeah. it, yeah. you kind of have to be in th- like a couple of places at once while you're I mean, while yeah. you're doing these characters, which is really that, that, really interesting. Yeah, I totally agree. And and going off of that, it's also um, writing a character for a video game. You never know how much the, how much of the uh, the player knows about him because you don't know how engaged they are. Right. So um, yeah, and that's that's kind of the challenge with you know optional dialogue, the optional stuff you mentioned, like can never be essential to the character arc or not not all of it can be essential mm-hmm. so, but yeah mm-hmm. that's a bit of a tangent ben when when you and i guess when you and nicolas or shori i decide okay this is just bar we've landed on you know how he talks how he's what he how he sounds like what are his speech patterns mannerisms quirks when he's talking um how much of that came from you and how much of that was coached in you by them there was i would say there was a good bit of both really i mean there was a lot of based off of our initial conversations it felt like i had a fairly clear idea of what they were going for with jaspar as a character Mm -hmm. of the tone they were trying to set all of that was was also fed by the dialogue that they were providing like Mm -hmm. all the dialogue that was coming from nicholas was like okay my interpretation of this character is seems to be pretty on point as yeah. far as what they're looking for from this guy, especially based off of his dialogue. Mm-hmm. Um, there was that cynicism. There was that. Uh, there was some sarcasm that was in there as well, but that also tied into the cynicism, um, and that clearly was fed by other stuff throughout his his history. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the there was coaching. But it wasn't mm-hmm. it wasn't the traditional style of coaching that you'd see, like where we would have a Zoom session or something like that, and okay. we'd be talking about an individual scene. It was more mm-hmm. of uh, a lot of back and forth via email. Can can we yeah. try okay. yeah. this a little different? Can we try this line a little different? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then ultimately, what ends up happening is if once you've done that enough, the overall tone or feel starts to sort of permeate all the rest of it and okay. it helps the rest of it just sort of come up to that same place um if that makes any sense it's like i uh, think it does you're you get so used to whatever yeah. the changes they are they want certain uh inflections in certain spots and things like that and how a certain character talks if you spend enough time with them you start to get accustomed to that and it just becomes kind of second nature and right that helps minimize the amount of stuff that you need to revisit um now also there were there were stuff that there was stuff that was getting rewritten or things that were quests that were changing and stuff like that i mean that yeah that that happens that's that's part of development that's 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 life you were, you were extremely patient <laughs> like i was i was so nitpicky well and everything and, and 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 even though as you said like you had a an extremely good grasp um um on the character early on as you said but even so, it's just like, I think I think I, I was I was so nitpicky with some of the lines and some mm. like the some interpretations and all that. So, but if you're if you're accustomed to working with directors and they have a very clear vision in their mind, mm-hmm. then yeah. that's not that's not a problem. That's that's just yeah. that's just how it is. Right. That's 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 the collaborative process and right. finding that is is one of those skills you pick up, one of those things that you just get accustomed to doing. And right. 
it shouldn't offend anybody. It shouldn't. It shouldn't make you upset. It's the the director knows exactly what they're exactly. what they're after here, and they they're after that for a reason. They're after that because it fits with the tone of the I, piece. You're absolutely right because I I can relate to that as a musician because I did band all through sure. pretty much since I was ten, and the band director you know trusts the musician to know how to play their instrument and know how to play it well, but he or she still needs to direct the overall orchestra, the overall band. I need you to come out more. I need you to do blah. Like she constantly has to give us that feedback, even though there is a respect between the two. Sure. To, that we're doing our, we're just doing our jobs and we're just collaborating. So I kind of see that yeah. translating with, with this process yep, as well. It's exactly the same. Yeah. I mean, it kind of took me some, personally, it took me some getting used to, especially during live sessions, because I always felt so rude to interrupt. But then again, like Germans have like a reputation for being frank and rude. And so. <laughs> say blood. Yeah, it runs in the blood. Yes. So. No, but I. Well, I, that had to be tough for you guys. I can't even. I can't even imagine because you had to. Doing the the multiple languages. Oh, I had to have like absolutely. Like I remember the first. So as you know, um, like I mean, we knew each other well by that um, couple of months in, but. Um, as you know, Dave Fenoy from from The Walking mm -hmm. Dead yes. also um, helped us out. Like he's such a cool guy, and I just remember I knew him from Walking Dead, and he his from performance. Walking Dead. Moved me, yeah, his performance moved me to tears, and so um, I just remember this. You know, I was sitting in the in the same room with this stupid webcam and this shitty microphone, <laughs> and then suddenly Dave Fenoy, like we're doing a live <laughs> session, just yes. pops up to the screen, and it, it just looked so imposing you know with this like this yes. silver dreadlocks and, and his, his voice and, his yeah. voice and just his like, voice oh, Nicholas. And I was like hello <laughs> <laughs> I was just kind of I was uh, but actually like once once we got started it was all good like he was he was so chill and I was yeah, yeah. I, I would say I, I feel confident like I, I enjoy this I enjoy talking with people and that's yeah. why but at first it just feels intimidating especially if you knew know these actors and if they're so Right now, well, yeah. when you amazing voices when you told me that uh that lanny was gonna be oh lanny is a dealer it was like oh my god are you kidding me i'm going to i'm going to be yeah. i'm sharing a scene with her yeah. and then we've already talked about spoilers so I, yeah 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 and then and then what happens to my character what that she does and then the player has to go and yeah yeah it was it was it was amazing it blew my mind it was like yeah. Oh my God, that's the coolest thing ever. I cannot believe that she gets to kill me. That's so <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. You mentioned you mentioned this before, uh, Ben, and I, I'm glad you did because it's actually one of the major questions I was going to ask you mm. is, what? could you just dive in into a little bit more detail? What are the major differences between doing voiceover or voice acting work over maybe some of the more traditional or classical like theater or acting work? Well, the... There are certain techniques you got to get used to. The, you got to get mm -hmm. used to working around the mic, uh, and mm. it, it's different than than working on stage or working with stage mics or mm -hmm. uh, anything that you're typically used to doing. Handheld mics or the the small stage mics. Sure. Um, so there's some technical differences to it, and a lot of the the in this era you have to know at least some basics about audio engineering just to be able to to sort of mm. get into the industry um especially nowadays uh so that that is challenging sometimes like that uh, okay. that was one aspect that i didn't know anything about um the other thing that is challenging with most vo and or maybe not challenging it's just different from theater uh mm. that is that is almost not quite the case with Enderall, which is a little strange and we'll, we'll get into it in just a second, is typically you're going to have this short session where you are just going to be blasting through a character and it needs to basically just come right out fully formed. It's got to be like you will not be evolving the character, you will not be forming the character over time. There mm -hmm. will just you'll have a couple of quick notes and you'll move on and you'll just go like right through all of the characters dialogue. So you might have a character that, that talks for half the game, but you might spend 
all of 20 minutes formulating who this person is and then rip through everything they have to say, uh, mm -hmm. which is challenging. It, it is it is a mm -hmm. different style of acting. I know I've talked to to Nicholas actually about this a little bit. It's like mm -hmm. it's the the. It's like playing speed chess versus playing mm. like you're just sitting at the the table thinking about right. your move, having as much time as you need. Yeah. Voice acting tends to be the you've got to get in there and commit to what you're choosing as an actor, what the character you really got to lean into those character decisions um, mm. and really run with it. And mm -hmm. That is something you kind of have to train yourself to do because uh, stage on stage, you have this collaborative process. You have this time that you spend yes. with the director, with the writer sometimes where you're you're forming the character as you go. You're you're starting from a place and maybe where you started doesn't look anything like where the character ends up. And that's mm -hmm. kind of part of the part of the whole process. Uh, Vio doesn't necessarily have that. Vio, Vio starts yeah. with that last like you're already three quarters of the way there and and you just finish off that last quarter while you're sitting down with the the director and mm. with the and sometimes with the writer who knows There's, there can be a bunch of people involved but um that goes kind of across the board for like uh right. commercial work or for mm. for video game work or for for a mm. lot of the character driven type stuff um, when it comes to VO and that's something that just takes some getting used to that's right uh, you don't have that that growth period with a character mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's that's the difference with Enderall is that we kind of did in this situation mm -hmm. we spent so much time with with Jaspar as a character over the last six years that he has kind of just grown and evolved via the collaborative process which mm -hmm. is really really cool because it's not something mm -hmm. you see that often in the VO industry. And I, when yeah. I was doing it at the time, I kind of, I was kind of aware that what we were doing was a little bit different from what you would normally see in this industry as a whole, because mm -hmm. yeah. I had already done enough, enough other stuff that was like, mm -hmm. okay, you have to get it, you get in, you commit to the character, you make your choices and you move on. Mm -hmm. sure. With Jaspar, it was this sort of evolving and growing thing that I think does allow for more texture, Yes. To the mm -hmm. character. It, it adds all these little just bits of depth mm -hmm. that, that makes the character feel a little bit more alive, which is, which is mm -hmm. awesome. And I think it's also a tough thing to replicate in, in, in mm -hmm. video game VO because of the way that you have to record it, the way that you have to get in. Yeah. I mean, I think those there's lines like a, yeah, I think there is a change, like change at least for some of the, you know, super triple quadruple A titles with, uh, you know, motion capture and performance capture. This is the different, but, but, but again, this is the exception and it's incredibly expensive still. Yeah. But um, I totally know what you mean. And as a writer, I think it's kind of, it's kind of sad because, you know, I can say now, like I've, I've worked on three, I've written three commercial games and I can just say that um, the character depth and the characters just suffer under that. Even if the ex actors are excellent, like, um, I'm in awe whenever um, I sit into like a voice session with uh, a studio because they just walk in there and they just develop the character as you know the recordings yeah. get along. It's incredible, but even so, yes. I I still think uh, I'm, I'm not as perf uh, much of a perfectionist. I just can't be. I can't be as um, like w we like the writer and the actor. We just don't have the time to to really flesh out the character, and I think that's yeah. really sad. Yeah. So um, I much prefer the mode we had in Andral. Um, mm. Yeah, but it is. Yeah, it is very much the exception to the rule, just because it of the is. fact mm -hmm. that for sure. you typically you just don't have the time. You don't have the the yeah. the, the booth time costs money. I mean, it, it it's yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah you sure. you have to you really you just have to get in. You have to get the character created, and then you have to move on. Right. It's, um, it's, it's crazy when yeah, sitting. I also sat in some. Um, German VO sessions, and they, you know, they base everything off the uh, English audio. So that their pace is just, it's just freaking insane. Like they just, they just hear the line and they, they have to uh, immediately replicate it. And I think it's yeah. like one take. Um, I don't know. It depends on how long the take is, but, mm. but usually you have like 10 seconds for every take. 
depending on how long it is. And mm. it's just that's like you just it don't is. Yeah, that, get that's crazy. Time with the character and, well, I can also imagine another challenge is that you're not actually interacting with the other actors because normally you're just kind of isolated in your booth or that. That absolutely. Have you ever? That absolutely okay. is, and that is something that. Um, <laughs> Honestly, it didn't even cross my mind because it's something I'm so so. You're so I, used to now. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, it is a very strange sensation when right. you're first getting used to it. The fact that yeah. you you don't necessarily have that that feedback. If you are doing a live session, um, the director might actually might actually say those lines with you, and that mm -hmm. that does help. That that does give you something to work with. Um, mm -hmm. but you also kind of have to train yourself to do that anyway. Right. Um, and sometimes if you're like way back in the beginning, when I was first getting started, then you had these scripts from folks who were, who were just coming up with mods for Skyrim, for new Vegas, things like that. Mm -hmm. You'd get scripts that didn't have the lead in line <laughs> yeah. at all. All you had was your text and you had to just kind of surmise what the other characters were saying they may not have even had the text written completely yet mm -hmm. but they knew what you wanted to say what they wanted you to mm -hmm. actually be saying right um and you just kind of had to figure that out you had to sort right. of it's almost like an improv exercise to be honest you're you're like right. you're coming up with the lead-in dialogue it's like it's like jeopardy where you have to come up with the question yeah. that's kind of what you ended up having to do uh and you do yeah. kind of get accustomed to that you get used to envisioning what the other person is saying hearing it in right. your head and then and then having your dialogue you have to hope that what you're thinking of is how the player not only just the player character the player is mm. thinking of the line which yeah. is which is an interesting challenge because not everybody thinks about that the same way right. so you have to hope exactly you have to hope that you're thinking of the most common way to interpret that delivery leading into your line sure. so that your response makes sense. I just have to say that as a writer, as a game writer, it kind of makes me angry if studios don't um, at least provide lead in lines. Like that just seems to me as like very sloppy and mm. even to a certain extent disrespectful of the actors and also disrespectful mm. of the story because you know, there's still like the sentiment going around the games community that, you know, story, nobody cares about story, people will just click mm. through it. Like if I, honestly, if I got a, uh, a dollar or a euro for every time someone has told me that, then I'd be rich. Like it's, it's nuts. <laughs> like people, there are just some people who are firmly convinced that sure. storytelling doesn't matter. And that's where this comes from mm. because, you know, it's absurd, like not providing an actor with the lead in line and context, it's nuts because obviously, like you will you you turn the performance into a guess and obviously yeah. Yeah. um the story like the this the quality will suffer for it and absolutely and, yeah. and i don't understand that so whenever yeah. someone does that like whatever project i work and i always try to make sure the actors get yeah. the information because you're you're really just kind of mm -hmm. blindfolded throwing darts and just hoping yeah. you're like yes. okay i think right. i know what they're going for i'm just based off of what i have to say here and mm -hmm. It does, honestly, in that in that situation, I think there were a lot of people who were learning how to do that kind of stuff back at that time mm. because there was a lot of there were a lot of new people getting into the the development industry as a whole. Uh, mm -hmm. It felt like one of those. It kind of felt like the Wild West, where it was like there were mm -hmm. a, there was this massive influx of of new people who who were younger who may have never done anything like this before. Who were who were really just diving in for the first time and figuring this stuff out as they went along, mm -hmm. um, sure. and that's that's what it felt like to me back then when I was mm -hmm. first getting rolling. I don't even know, God, almost a decade ago now. I also think that another added complexity: not only are you not interacting with the other actors directly, is that the player character is meant to be an empty canvas. Yes, and you kind of have to. You're supposed to create this connection with them and you're supposed to develop friendship or maybe even more Absolutely. with this person but that character is not really defined for you no, or not at all so and so somehow <laughs> you have to you're basically acting with this notion that this character is really can be anyone mm -hmm. this faceless character could be anyone and that to me i think is really really hard well and it, <laughs> it's do. it's rough because you end up having to 
you have it you have to accept the fact that there are going to be some people that are going to approach this in a different way and mm. what you're doing is not going to speak to them mm -hmm. and all you can hope is that what you're doing is mm -hmm. is achieving the direct the vocal director's goals mm -hmm. and that that it reaches hopefully the majority of the audience that mm -hmm. that what yeah. they're what they're shooting for from a performance standpoint is mm -hmm. is going to is going to reach the the group of people that they're after and if you're lucky it's the majority of the people who play the project sometimes it might not be but i'm sure that there are that there are people out there that that wouldn't necessarily connect with with a lot of my performances that's that's just mm. the nature of these things and it it, mm. it ties directly to that whole they're just coming from a different place as a player character yeah. and mm. it's you can only you can only really commit one performance for the NPCs or for anything that the player has to interact with mm -hmm. uh, and it can't be it can't be so varied that it can actually handle all of those those different possibilities mm. from the player which sure. is kind of a bummer but there's no there's no real way around it right you, you right you kind of have to just pick that lane and you have to and you have to jump in yeah so Ben what would you say um, if you can remember what would you say was your favorite scene to do Ooh. in the game as just bar Wow. Uh, yeah. oh, I know what God. mine is, but I want to know what yours was. <laughs> but I know what mine was. <laughs> it, it might be the scene... It might be the scene in the brothel. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, when... Where he has the breakdown. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. that, that was... That was certainly a compelling one. That one was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Um... Mm -hmm. It was because uh, you don't get to see that kind of thing in video games. Mm -hmm. It feels like you don't get to see that kind of thing in video games very often, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where a character uh, just basically has a nervous breakdown, and yeah. and you kind of yeah. just have to stand there and watch this person melt down, and yeah. not be able to like punch a button or mm -hmm. do something to make to save them. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, you just have to let them work through their trauma. And that's sure. That's not the kind of thing that you see in a lot of video games. But the uh, sure the um, that's definitely that's definitely way up there. Um, there were a lot of fun ones. There were a lot of ones that I really enjoyed, and especially mm -hmm. like uh, I really enjoyed the the scene with Adila. I loved the, the mm -hmm. scene yes. with Lanny. That was that was yes. incredible. Yes. Yes. Um, God. Some of them all just blur together. That's the other thing too, is there was sure. so much. Those are probably the two that stick out to me the most. Yeah. The one that, that I love both of those mm. as well. Those yeah. are definitely within top three. And and I think one that was that really stuck in my head was something that I brought up with Nicholas last time is the is the talk in the airship when when your character could start the romance, but prior to that, you get a really profound um, explanation of how Jaspar sees relationships, which really challenges, I think, the traditional mindset of how relationships work. Absolutely. And so I... that, like, when you read that in the script, like, what did you think of that? Because, you know, you're you're presumably in a very traditional relationship with your wife and your kids. Yeah. And, and here's a character who, like, really is challenging the notion of love and what does... Do you only have one true love out there, and well, it's and, and it's things like that. I do, I do remember recording that scene. That was that scene was awesome as well, and it's another one of those like you don't see that getting yeah, talked about in video games in that in that capacity like ever mm -hmm. in video games. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually thought of one more scene after that. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, we can talk we'll, about we'll that. We'll talk too. about yes. that in a second. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the yeah the um, the. The thing with that scene is that it felt so appropriate for the character. It's, it felt so sure. so correct for him to have that kind of worldview, just based mm -hmm. off of we knew what we knew about him. I mean, it was it was the organic answer, which mm -hmm. is having that level of sort of 
this is going to sound weird. Emotional honesty, I guess, is the, the thing that I'm, mm-hmm. I'm looking for here when it comes mm-hmm. to characters in video games. It's not something you normally see. And it's that was one of the things that as we were doing the project, it became very easy to get like emotionally invested in in the characters that we were creating. I, mean, I can't speak for the other voice actors, but I can certainly speak for myself. And mm-hmm. he seemed like a fully realized human being, which is a testament mm-hmm. to, to Nicholas. Actually, and, and yes, the writing is is mm-hmm. amazing because you don't typically get that opportunity to do that with with a video game character. And I think it makes it makes for a level of engagement from the player that you wouldn't mm-hmm. normally see because mm-hmm. you don't get all of that texture. You don't get those conversations where you just get to sit there and sort of talk philosophy and talk worldview and talk how he how he views the world and how he views relationships and have it mm-hmm. be honest to the character and not necessarily just honest to what a portion of the audience wants to hear. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think that makes it way more impactful and I think it it increases the attachment that people will feel toward it because it feels unique because it feels mm-hmm. like such a rarity in in this medium and mm-hmm. reading it was was incredibly refreshing it was like it was like, of course he would feel this way. This is, this is exactly mm-hmm. how he would feel. Based off of everything yeah. we know about this person, that is that is true to him. And I'm sure there are some people that probably weren't necessarily fans of that. And that's mm-hmm. that's neither here nor there. They might want the more traditional sense of things. And that's, that's fine. But for Jaspar, it made mm-hmm. the, it made perfect sense. It was, it was, exactly how I feel like it should have gone down. And that made that whole scene, that scene, oddly enough, was incredibly easy to record because by the time oh. we had, by the time we had gotten to that point, the, yeah, the, the person who he was, was already crystal clear in my mind. And it was yeah. like, yes, mm. of course, this is how he is. I know exactly how this scene is going to play out. I know exactly mm-hmm. what to do with this. And, gotcha. um, yeah, that one just felt completely natural coming out because it felt like the right thing were the the right thing in that moment to say. So it it was it was it was kind of a beautiful scene. It was awesome. You mentioned there was another scene that you there was that popped into your head. There was uh, the death scene. The um not the one with Adila. The uh, the other one at the very very end. Oh <clears throat> yes. Yeah yeah mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. the which is tied I guess tied to one of the different endings. Like if you yes pick mm-hmm. yes. So it's the one where if he's he's on the ground. Uh, mm-hmm. Yes, and they've mm-hmm. activated the beacon. Yes, yes, uh, and they, you find him like lying right. on the ground. That was a lot yeah. of fun to record because typically, <laughs> uh, w- one of the big benefits of the whole VO side of things uh, versus theater is that you can be really quiet. You can have this additional layer of texture mm. because the mic is right there. It's picking up every little nuance and every little detail as opposed to theater where you have to generally be larger and louder so that it picks things up. Uh, so when it came to something like that sequence where he was clearly fading and he was mm. burning out as a person, mm-hmm. um, you could really just lean in to the fact that mm-hmm. there was not much left. And that was, that was so much fun to record because you, you normally don't get to do that stuff, and you're like, wow, boy, this feels real good. I hope, I hope it it translate well because it the, the yes the uh, you never quite know. That's the other crazy thing. You never quite know how this stuff is going to, to come off once it gets, into the game and gets on screen right. and gets in front of right. people. And that was one part that was like, wow, I, I really hope this, this feels, as rough in right. game as it does when you're recording it. I always find it so interesting how many actors in general, not just voice actors, when asked, like, what are some of your favorite or most fun scenes to do? Many of them say my death scene. <laughs> I find that really profound. Interesting, because, like, for the, for the viewers, we're like, no, because I'm so sad that the character's gone. Sure. But the actors are like, I love my death scene. I love well, and in, I, in, I think that's really interesting. In a lot of games, that might be one of the one of their big 
character right. moments. I was like, exactly. going to say the same thing. It's usually, yeah. because, it's usually like the climax of all like the yeah. Yes. So they're not necessarily so. given a whole lot of opportunity to have all of right. this additional fleshed out dialogue. And that's right. kind of the big moment, typically. Exactly. For an NPC. Right. So. Right. It's their last, it's their last, literally their last moments. You got to give it all you got. Right. And you just, there's no limits. You just. Yep. Go no, for it. Sometimes you've got nothing to nothing to lose at this point. Right. Literally nothing to lose. Sometimes it's <laughs> screaming at the top of your lungs. Sometimes right. it's it's the little quiet humanity yeah. is slipping away kind of moments. There's there's all sorts of yeah. But the, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of fun to be had in those spaces. Sure. And uh, yeah, that that was definitely a lot of fun. <laughs> um, it really excited me when I found that you yourself are, are a gamer as well. <laughs> so I have to ask this question now. Did you play Enderal? And if you did play Enderal, did you romance yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I, that, I, Would you have romanced yourself if you played Enderal? I honestly, okay. <laughs> I, I have not. And, okay, okay. Uh, to be honest, I, I can't play any of the games I'm in. That you're in. I, I can I get that. I, I cannot do that. it. I've tried. <laughs> I tried back in the day and it Yeah. It makes me nuts. I find I find no enjoyment from it, which is painful. And I know part of me right. should be like, no, 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 no. You should be able to turn that part of your brain off. I just can't. Yeah. I can't do it. I can't even be in the room if if other people are playing it. Like right. the if the kids are trying to play one of the games, it makes me crazy mm -hmm. because I just, I just will only hear every little tiny thing that I'm like, man, I should have done that differently. Wow. Really? I could have, or I could have, I could have amped that up just a little tiny bit. And yeah. part of that might be coming from live theater. You don't get that opportunity to go back and look at it. Like mm. the performance is, Right. It's almost this organic is... thing that lives on stage, and then when you move on, it's done. And yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't get to revisit it over and over and over and over and yeah. over again, and think about all the things you could have done differently. And my brain can't. Yeah, not. it's it's so common though. Like I'm even sure, I'm sure it's got to be. TV actors, movie actors, all the time. I hear them say, "I can't watch my own movie," or "I can't watch yeah. my own TV show," and I I understand that because yeah. I it's 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 totally. But it's it's. You did mention that your your kids were playing some of the games that you're in. So so then I have to ask, do they think that's cool? Do they think is my dad's pretty cool, or is it like whatever? My dad's in I, my dad's a voiceover, I, whatever. I think <laughs> they it don't was. Care. I think it was the first one for a little while. Okay, it was cool for a while. Yes, but then and now it has since moved on to do just. Uh, it's just a thing yeah. Dad does. It's just like <laughs> meh. It's it's okay. That's great. Right. Sure. That's yeah. Good for him. That's that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, there was. It's it's. I think they were intrigued in the beginning, and I, I'm not. I don't, they they kind of seem pretty nonplussed about it now. Which I mean, I guess that's probably a good thing. They've kind of gotten used to it. That's that that's exciting. Um, I would imagine that if it would be like, I'd show up in one of. The, just one of the random games that they they and all their buddies are playing right. in multiplayer. And right. if they didn't know, if I could like okay. spring it on them and surprise them, they'd be playing the game and then be like, that sounds like bad. That might actually have an impact. But I would need... In a good way? In, in a, a good, good way, way or a bad in a way? In a good way. Okay, good. So it's not like they're embarrassed. Like, oh no. My gosh, oh, no. My dad's, no, 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 no. my dad's in Mortal Kombat. No, oh, my God. no. Like, <laughs> That would be that would be hilarious, yeah. Yeah, I'll have to think about that. Like, if it is one that they might play, maybe I should keep it quiet and then yeah. just like wait. Be like, wait a minute. Wait until they play it and then be like, hold on. Does that sound familiar? Did you did you do this? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that idea. I love it. That's that'd be great. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Nicholas, I have to ask: Do you have any fun uh, anecdotes or fun moments uh, working with Ben? Uh, either in the game or in the in the audiobooks. <laughs> oh man, I'm so bad with anecdotes. I think you asked something similar about the development last time, and we've been at this for so long that mm -hmm. there have to be some. Yeah, I'm but sure there are plenty. They... Or maybe like a really big blooper that just you couldn't stop laughing at. Or I well, know. I know, like I know, I know the the one of the accents in in the audiobook is 
a challenge. And that's mm. the McKay who accent. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have gotten a chance to talk about it, but wow, that is a doozy. That is like I was that one is yeah takes a while to wrap my brain around. I, I have a question specifically for that. Oh, okay, was right. was was how how what you know going into the audiobook, like how did you train to do an imagine taking an imaginary language and then working with the accent of that imaginary language like what was that process like for you well i mean for me the only thing that we really had to go on was the fact that it was it was sort of quasi polynesian in in mm -hmm. its basis like hawaiian mm -hmm. might be the most um the closest the closest analog in the real world but even then that's that's such a such a specific thing that trying to wrap my brain around how to say the dialogue with that accent was 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 tricky it was rough especially because it when you're doing the audiobook the audiobook is almost like a like a one man stage play you're bouncing right. back and forth between all of between, these different these characters. characters yeah mm -hmm. Including the narrator, which is sort of right. off in its own headspace, which is mm -hmm. still tied to the main character's headspace, but still not the same. Sure. And the the Makehu stuff was so wildly different from the rest of it that it ended up being we went back and forth a bunch on on trying to iron that out. And Nicholas, I think you got in touch with the linguist and Yes. They recorded yes. examples of some of the lines. They basically, basically, the linguist uh, Daviti, um, he recorded every every line, you know, every line in Makehu, which is, you know, a whole other uh, thing, you know, because I have trouble uh, pronouncing this and I, I know this language somewhat. <laughs> and uh, then we also recorded all the accented lines, like every English line that's supposed to have a Makehu accent. Um, mm. We recorded references, but mm -hmm. but I think that's the best way. That was the best way to go about this because um, otherwise, you know, it would have distracted you from the acting. Well, and then, yeah, that's the hard part is trying to maintain any kind of momentum when you get to those spots, and then your brain is like, oh, okay, wait a minute, because now I gotta mm -hmm. now I gotta switch into the out of the the yes Kilean into the Polynesian. Uh, and mm -hmm. sometimes back to back, like, mm -hmm. and having the examples there makes, makes a world of difference because I can, I can run through those lines and then I can just be like, okay, now I just need to take that. I need to perform it. Um, because the lines aren't necessarily sure. performed. They're just, they're just, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I didn't perform they're just either. a vocal, just a vocal basis of what the, yeah. what the, the, the dialect itself sounds like. Sure, um, sure. So it presents it presents a really engaging challenge, uh, oh, yeah. and but it is it's it's really it's really compelling when it works. It's great. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh. It's just a it it's a lot. It it it's what it's tricky. What what, what do you do? You have a favorite phrase I collect, uh, <laughs> in that language? In Mikhehu? Oh, Mikhehu. <laughs> oh my god! It's okay if the answer is no, but <laughs> I'm trying to think of. We're not that far in yet. No, yeah, it would be. Okay, okay. It would be. Oh, you haven't recorded all the books no, yet. No, not yet. Got it. Not yet. Or, or it would all be the, the book um, yet. Okay. So far, it would be something from the the first chapter, with the okay. the. There's an argument at, um, this little pond, between okay. uh, a a Makehu um local mm -hmm. and okay. some members of the Blue Guard, mm -hmm. and the Makehu local gets to really lay into these people for. Mm. Effectively charging people to be able to use the what had been. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, I remember. And mm -hmm. uh, it um, that was fun to record, especially once once we had the yeah yeah so once good. we had the the clips. It was like, yeah. oh, okay, all right, I know yeah, what to do with yeah, this. Really this is great. It. It's, it's great. And then I'm, and then you get to chew on it a little bit from a dialogue standpoint, and really, really just bite off some of that stuff and, and lean into the words and really get angry with it. And that was, that was awesome. So it would be something in there. I can't remember the exact words because it still is full of all of these vowels. It's like, oh, man, it's, it's so like awesome. O's and I's and they're all over the place. And it, it, uh, off the top of my head, it just doesn't yeah. leave to mind. Yeah. But, I agree. Uh, it would be in there. It would definitely be in there.
I think uh, I think Makehu um, is still a lot easier than the Karenian, this the language from the second book, because it's like a mixture of Arabian and African. <laughs> and so, okay, wow. Yeah, that, yeah, that will be these, exciting. Yeah, there are all these throaty uh, sounds, like the and, and I try to my linguist um, uh, David he recorded uh, one line which is which is pretty cool. Um, basically means don't trust flat dunes, which kind of means that you should, don't trust like a deal that looks too good. Yeah. Um, and I just couldn't pronounce it. I tried to I tried to replicate what he said, but it's just so foreign. It's it's crazy. But yeah. So. Well, as long as as long as there's no Makehu and Karanian, there is there is there is there's a Makehu character. <laughs> but it's not side Wonderful. by side. So it should, as long as it's not side by side, that's all that really matters. If, they, <laughs> if those two were side by side, it would be like, oh my god, my brain is so going to short circuit. But yeah. that's fine. If we have the if we have the audio, the 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 sample clips recorded, that'll mm -hmm. that'll make all that uh, super easy. We've kind of figured out the the process yeah. to try and tackle that stuff, so that yeah. makes it much much easier. So, so how much of the of the first book have you uh, recorded so far? Then? I actually, how far are you in? I sent over the, I think stuff for the fourth chapter last yeah. night. Okay, yeah. you're still in the fourth yeah, chapter. Yeah. But it's, do you know? Have you have you read the full book yet? Oh yeah, or, yeah, yeah. yeah so you, so you know what happens. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yep, I'm all with you. Okay. So, gotcha. 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 Yeah. How, so how do you? Because I haven't had a chance to listen to the audiobook because it's not necessarily released mm -hmm. yet. Um, what? How do you? come up with the voices for all of the other characters because obviously you know how Jaspar sounds and now you have to you know you have to come up with a voice for um Lysia and uh Kawu Kawu is how you pronounce yep. his name Kawu. Kawu and then all the other side characters like how how much of it is this Ben go to town from Nicholas and how much is 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 again coach well I mean some of it kind of starts it starts with the text the text sort of provides you with a foundation of the overall temperament of a character, the overall um, personality of a character, which can feed into what their the vocal feel that you're going to be looking for, the tone, kind of timber of the person. Um, and then typically it's it's I'll start with something and then I'll send it off, and Nicholas can go through it and listen to it and say, okay, this isn't quite what we're looking for. Let's let's revamp a little bit try this try that um it's kind of similar to the process that we used for enderall it, it's yes, a very organic yeah. kind of it just sort of grows out of that that point um it's just a lot more about you know pitch and timber because yeah. it's we, we just actually, me yeah we have we actually just re uh, recorded or settled on a vo found a voice for lysia and that was very challenging because um lysia you know if, if i were to cast like a female, a female voice actor were to 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 um to act her, then she would, you know, I'm envisioning like a darker, a gruffer kind of tone. But if if Ben uses like his gruff gruff speaking voice and he sounds like a man, obviously, right? So, yeah, so that so doesn't quite really work. And, yeah, but I think we found something like something that sounds, you know, obviously, um, it's not never going to sound like a woman, but it's mm -hmm. like enough to to set them apart. And I think we found something, but there was a lot of work. I think Lysia was the most work so far. Yeah, which, I mean, that doesn't really surprise me just because of the fact that she's going to talk the most. See, I mean, mm -hmm. from a character standpoint, she probably has the second most lines to just bar. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, sure, sure. She, having her, well, and the narrator, obviously, the narrator. Way, way more than everybody, but the uh, <laughs> having, have, uh, Kawu, yeah, Kawu's up there too. He's got a lot of, a lot of dialogue, but the, the, Pinning those characters down in the beginning, working through those characters does help because once you sort of get it set in stone, moving forward isn't really as tricky. Yeah, that's um, true. So spending that time in the beginning and ironing out all that stuff, you will, you'll reap the benefits later on because it speeds up the whole process. Same if that makes sense. Well, thank you, everyone. I think that is at least what we have for the, at least mostly talking about uh, the video game Endral with Ben. Um, we will have a part three where we will actually dive into the Dreams of the Dying book um, and talk a little bit more, well, I mean way more with Nicholas this time. <laughs> um, and also Ben about um, just Bar's journey and just 
being going through the audiobook itself and that experience for for the third time so if you have any questions that you want me to ask either of these two please feel free to put them down in the comments below there are gonna sure. be a lot of questions I'll this to, to you think there'll us. be a lot of okay <laughs> oh, well, yeah, we'll, so. we'll try to prioritize them and pick the the biggest ones um, for both of them um, and yeah just again to both Ben and Nicholas thank you so much for for taking the time out to chat with me um, as a giant fanboy fan of your work both of your work it's been an amazing experience um, and I'm very grateful uh, to hopefully be able to do this again with you soon <laughs> awesome sounds good so, thank you thank you very much thank you um, and until next time everybody love yourselves and love each other bye bye <laughs>